Mark Rogers, TV, Voice of Cali Football, breaking down as many rosters as we can possibly get to. We've already uh, taken a look at the um, Notre Dame offense, courtesy Ben Belden from Slap the Sign. Please check out that video. And we've got to, of course, have Ben back to talk Notre Dame on defense. And considering the time of year and this crazy pandemic and how it's played havoc with the college football season. Before we look at the defense, we've got to talk about this Notre Dame situation because it has caused so much controversy, so much talk on social media. Uh, you probably get sick of the year-to-year -year Notre Dame needs to join a conference, but that has been ratcheted up <laughs> tenfold uh, because of the situation with the Big Ten and then the Pac-12 deciding no out-of-conference games. And then that... Um, spurred on some talk concerning the ACC possibly making that decision at one point. What would happen to Notre Dame? Well, there's all sorts of speculation of what could happen to Notre Dame. I think it's safe to say that Notre Dame has found a safe haven in the ACC. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, uh, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion at this point that Notre Dame, you know, gets a home in the ACC this year uh for football at least i mean they they play in the acc and pretty much all of their other major sports um i don't know i think i i like the idea of playing you know the six acc games that they had scheduled already and then you know there's been talk about how uh you know one of the open dates that they have after losing you know their big 10 and they being notre dame their big 10 and uh pac 12 opponents uh coincides with a date that miami has open um so adding them would be cool as well. Um, you and I were just talking off air that I'm not a big fan of the proponent of the, the three to five team divisions within the ACC. And then having, you know, playing a home and home against your other four opponents, because, you know, geographically that puts Notre Dame with, you know, a bunch of schools that frankly, I'm not uh, real excited about Notre Dame playing a total of eight times. However, I mean, I guess it does soften the schedule a little bit. So I don't know. I mean, I think, if it, if it comes down to that or not playing football, I'd rather have that, obviously, certainly. But, um, you know, I, I, I think Brian Kelly's been pretty vocal about the fact that Notre Dame will play as many games as they're allowed to play and teams are calling and trying to use Notre Dame to fill out their schedule and things. So Notre Dame is going to have their opportunities, whatever it may be. And so I guess I feel good about that part, at least. I would love to give uh, credit where credit's due. Uh, I know what article you're referring to. I did not see it personally myself, but we did a live stream yesterday where we had some ACC talk and it was being bantied about three pod proposals thrown out. Right. Uh, one was more geographically based going kind of north to south, the other one going in the other direction, which kind of changed the configuration. And one just had to do with attractive matchups or maybe one was more in terms of competitive balance what it should look like uh the acc in my opinion would be the worst league in the country to do this just because of the dominance of clemson notre dame's inclusion helps that but clemson being so much better at least in the last five to six years than everyone else as soon as you throw them in a small division format with three or four other teams you basically saddle those teams with two losses and forget them <laughs> in, in regards to anything past uh, ACC play. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I don't know why you can't just put Notre Dame in the Coastal Division for one year and you're going to configure the schedule in some way uh, to maintain flexibility because of uh, pandemic guidelines and, and trying to ensure that there's some semblance of, of a schedule that's again, flexible that you can move games around and just add games and switch things around. But uh, we'll see how it plays out. And I'm sure we'll both have our opinions uh, when that time comes. But Notre Dame's going to have to field a football team with a good defense that it appears uh, will be in play with a lot of experience coming back. Uh, Julian Aquara, Khalid Kareem, uh, they move on. But other than that, uh, starting with the defensive front, line us up for, a, again, a team that's uh, coming back pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, I think, and that sort of speaks, what I'm going to say, I guess, sort of speaks to things that I've been saying about Notre Dame over the course of, you know, the last couple of years, to be honest with you. I mean, I've argued on this show and in things that I write, my own show and things that Notre Dame has depth uh, across the board 
that's better over the course of the last three years than it was at any other point, you know, since I've been a Notre Dame fan and I'm almost, I mean, 29 years old. So, I mean, it's not a huge <laughs> heck of a long time, but I can't honestly remember a time where I felt good about the two deep or as good about the two deep um, as I have, you know, now. And so um, you mentioned Julian Aquara and, uh, and Khalid Kareem moving on. Um, they'll have a fifth year graduate senior uh, in Dalen Hayes, who's um, who's going to fill Aquara's role as kind of the, I don't know what to call him, uh, the the drop defensive end, the, the kind of outside linebacker defensive end type hybrid position pass rusher um, who was really a highly touted guy, has played, you know, in pr- pretty much every year, um, since he's been on campus, um, he ended up getting hurt last year, and so he got a medical red shirt. Um, so big opportunity for him. They won't have much drop off there. And then Ade Ogandeji, who's been, you know, in and out of the lineup, but just kind of had to be parked behind a, a really good player in Khalid, Khalid Kareem, is going to get an opportunity. He'll be a fifth year as well um, in his final year of eligibility. And so there's not going to be a lot of drop off from those two big, uh, big losses, I suppose. And then they pretty much bring everybody else back with the exception of uh, Alohi, Alohi Gilman, who um, is on the chargers roster currently. Um, he's a safety and then, but they have, you know, a, a variety of safety talents coming back. I mean, Kyle Hamilton was one of the best freshmen in the country. Uh, Houston Griffith um, is going to play safety this year he, and he'll compete with a graduate transfer from Ohio state and Isaiah Pryor, um, probably for that other safety spot. So, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of experience uh, in different places coming back. And so Notre Dame's got to feel pretty good about what they're going to be able to do defensively. Yeah. When we talk, uh, Aquara and, uh, Kareem, I'm going to put some numbers together here. 50 tackles for loss combined for the entire career, of course, and uh, 28 sacks between the two of them. But uh, again, Dalen Hayes, that was a name that I kind of remember from the past, but had forgotten about, again, being off the radar for most of 2019, but going back to his 2018 production, not necessarily eye-popping statistically, but in regards to the level of play against the good opponents. And you mentioned uh, how he um, flashed against uh, Clemson in the playoff. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it, for both Dalen Hayes and Ade Ogundeji, I mean, they, they're in a unique spot in the fact that they kind of came in. In the case of Dalen Hayes, he kind of just came in, and then Julian O'Quara was just so good that he kind of just got shuffled behind him. Didn't necessarily mean that Dalen Hayes is a bad football player. It's just you can only play 11 guys on defense at one time, and Julian O'Quara played the same position as him. So um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's the best case scenario and i mean i think it's especially a great scenario to be in given that you know no team in college football really has had um you know team practices team workouts like in that regard yet to have all of that experience coming back um so i mean like i say this it, it worked out i suppose for these guys assuming that there is a college football season um, and because of guys like this i i really hope there is one because they came back because they had unfinished business yeah, it's a great point because I don't know if that we see another major sport with the turnover in the mass volume of college football because of the number of players that are needed to fill out a roster and because it's college athletics and you've only got these kids from two to four years, something in that range. And the supposed advantage of it would that it would be to have a veteran defense where everybody knows their assignments already. Sure, that's not the bet that's not what they would have wanted not having spring ball and individual workouts and everything but compared to what everybody else is facing with new personnel new coordinators for a lot of teams and so forth it seems to be a good position for notre dame ben belden slapped the sign one other question ben i always got to hit you with this one somebody watching notre dame early in the season looking at the defense you mentioned uh, some of the star players. Is there anybody that might be a little bit under the radar that you're looking forward to seeing? Yeah, so Notre Dame plays that uh, kind of like a four-two-five sort of kind of defense, where they have the uh, you know the traditional nickelback is really more of a linebacker safety hybrid. And last year, that was played by. And this is kind of a mouthful, and I always have to struggle to say this, to be honest with you. Jeremiah Owusu-Koromoa, um, nicknamed J-O-K. Um, 
And he played that position last year. He's back this year, and he is probably one of the players. I, you know, I, I should have mentioned him the first time. I mean, he's probably the best player in Notre Dame's defense um, that's returning in terms of you know what he did last year and then coming back for. Um, I mean, he technically has another year of eligibility if he wants it after this one. Um, but NFL scouts love him as a either a safety or if he bulks up a little bit as a linebacker. He's just one of those. He's got great speed, great instincts. Um, so he's going to be probably, you know, the anchor of, you know, the Irish defense to a, to a certain degree. And they move that rover position all around. He'll, he'll cover some, he'll blitz some, he'll be in run support, certainly. Um, so he's really going to be, he's number six. He'll be the guy to kind of keep an eye on in Notre Dame's defense for sure. He'll be the most, he's, I enjoy, I love watching this guy play. And obviously a junior college transfer since uh, this was his first year at the uh, major college ranks as a junior, correct? Correct. This past season. 80 yes. tackles led the team, 13 and a half tackles for loss, five sacks. He's all over the box score with uh, four passes defensed, a couple forced uh, fumbles and fumble recoveries as well. So, yeah, yeah, all over the field in the action. All right, Ben Belden slapped the sign. Please join him for more Notre Dame football coverage and athletics across the board. Ben, we appreciate you stopping by. Um, you know what? I'm going to keep you here for a few more seconds. I got one other thing for you because we're at a point where, uh, you know, typically we'd be looking at the schedule saying, okay, Wisconsin's going to be tough. Clemson, boy, what's our chances there? And trying to add up the wins and the losses. So this is a bit of a wild card with all the speculation of what the schedule could look like, uh, but it's obviously going to be even more ACC heavy, most likely than anticipated. So where's that line of demarcation in regards to expectations? What exceeds it? What falls short of it? Let's say you play 10 games. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I think I, the look of, of expectation really kind of remains the same. I mean, if you were looking at the schedule before it got, picked apart, I suppose you, you're sort of thinking like, well, you know, this is probably a 10 and two, 11 and one with a loss to Clemson and, you know, toss up between like Wisconsin or USC. Um, now that Wisconsin and USC are definitely off the schedule. Um, you still probably say, I mean, objectively lose to Clemson. Although I would argue to a certain degree, like if there's a time that Notre Dame can beat Clemson, it would probably be this year because Clemson would have to come to South Bend in early November and, I mean, let's just I, – I, so there's at least a little bit of a home field advantage considering a team from the South coming to, you know, sub-freezing temperatures. Let's just put it – at least put it that way. Um, I don't know. I think pretty much the expectation remains the same. And so it's a one, maybe two loss type of a team. Um, and like I say, if they get lucky and they can beat Clemson, um, which like I say, tall task regardless of the situation, um, then – like I say, it could be a really special year and maybe this, this little thing works out for him. Um, but yeah, like you say, it's really hard to, to kind of put a finger finger on what things are going to look like this year. All right, Ben, always enjoy the breakdown. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me on.